Hi everyone, Janie here. Welcome back to my garden. So today is Tuesday and Tuesday for me and my garden maintenance schedule means it is pest control day. So pest control day means taking care of any type of pest that is bothering my plants. Sometimes I will add in like pathogen control day like diseases or something like that um, if it is a problem but more times than not it's usually the pests the bugs that are the big problem for me and so it's kind of something I do like to stay on top of which it's why it's in my weekly schedule so my weekly schedule my weekly garden maintenance schedule is a schedule that I've set for myself to do the things in my garden that I don't want to do. <laughs> they, are, they are annoying things like fertilizing, like pest control, like weeding, um, things like that, that had I, if I just did it when I wanted to do it, it would never get done. So I've realized over the years that I've been gardening that keeping myself on a schedule makes a really big difference for me. And if I just, you know, take little bites, you know, that I'm not biting off more than I can chew one day. I hope that makes sense. So Monday is my fertilizing day in my schedule. Tuesday is pest control day. And I like having pest control day right after fertilizing day because fertilizing day, that gives me a chance to walk around the whole garden and kind of take a look at everything that's going on. And while I'm walking around the garden, I'm looking for certain things. I'm looking for signs of pest damage. And then I'll remember that, okay, well, tomorrow when I come out for pest control day, I need to get the BT or I need to get the sluggo or I need to get my latex gloves for aphids or whatever it is, right? So having Monday and Tuesday set up in that way it works really really well for me and then Wednesday is usually weeding day which is where I go around and weed I honestly I weed pretty much every day I'll like bend down and pick up a weed or something like that but Wednesday's the day that I purposely come out here and decide that I'm gonna weed Thursday is my house plant watering day Friday is the day that I consciously come out here with a blower and kind of clean all the the pathways up and then Saturday is the day that I trim my espaliers, you know, I kind of just prune stuff. Uh, Saturday, I like to deadhead as well, but again, deadheading is kind of like weeding. I kind of do it throughout the week whenever I'm out here. And then Sunday, I take the day off, but Jason does the lawn. So Sunday's my day off <laughs> for me. So yeah, so just sticking with that schedule, it, it's been working really, really well for us and it's been keeping things um, kind of organized and kind of on top of it. And I always admit to you guys, I do the best I can. Some days I just don't want to come out here and do it. And so I'll miss a day or I'll miss a week or something like that. And I think that that's okay. It's just a matter of trying to be as on top of it as possible. It's going to keep your garden looking as nice as possible. And then considering pests, it's going to keep the pest problems down, which is really important. So the four main pests that I deal with in my garden are budworms, uh, earwigs, slugs and snails, and aphids. Now, that doesn't mean that is the only pests that bother my garden. Those are the common culprits. Those are the um, frequent flyers in my garden, basically. And so, so those are the ones that I always kind of focus my mind on. And when I see some pest damage, um, that's kind of the first thing I think about. Now, I do not deal with Japanese beetles, knock on wood. And I know that that is a big thing for a lot of you. And so I can't totally help you out with Japanese beetles other than tell you what I learned in my Master Gardener's course, which is truly the only way to deal with Japanese beetles, or I should say the best way to deal with Japanese beetles is to take a bucket of warm soapy water and pick them off with your hands and drop them in the bucket. And I know that sounds absolutely terrible. I'm so sorry for all of you that have to deal with Japanese beetles, um, but that's what they said is the best way to deal with them. So. Of the four that I have in my garden, or the four categories, uh, what am I looking for? So the things I'm looking for when I walk around and I check you know, for pests or I'm fertilizing, I am looking for, uh, for first of all, for budworms, I'm looking for uh, the, the blooms of flowers, in particular petunias, to be chewed or to be eaten. Or even a plant that looks like, for some reason, it's not flowering very well, that, that's kind of a sure sign that you might have budworms. Then I'll look a little bit closer and if I see little black spots um, 
like a little bit bigger than a piece of sand, almost like a sprinkle. I know that's so gross. Black sprinkles. I'm sorry, you guys, <laughs> but um, that is budworm poop. <laughs> that is excrement. And that like, it is very easy to spot once you know what that looks like. Uh, I also actually can find the actual green worms on my plants sometimes and that you know that I, I feel like I've just trained myself to kind of pick them out. Um, yesterday when I was fertilizing I did find a big fat budworm over here on my homestead verbena and I should have taken a video of it or a picture of it, but I just automatically grabbed it, took it over to the ground and smashed it right here. Um, and then as soon as I did that, I said, oh, to Jason, oh, I should have, I should have saved that guy to show you guys. So I'm really sorry, but I do have other clips of budworms here. I'll show you what they look like. And then of course, also the excrement or the poop. So that's what I'm looking for, for budworms. If I see holes in leaves of the plants, my first thought is earwigs, or slugs and snails. I kind of look a little bit closer if I notice a slime trail. Obviously it's gonna be slugs and snails. If there's no slime trail and if the holes look a little jagged, then I'm gonna think earwigs. And I do have both of them. Earwigs are kind of year round, I think about, and slugs and snails are more when it's cooler. Really, it doesn't matter because I treat them both the same way. Then the last thing I'm looking for are signs of aphids. And I usually try and stay on top of it so I don't see the after effects of aphids, um, which would be like yellowing or disfigured leaves. I actually see the aphid bodies, the bugs, right? And we all know what those look like. But the thing I do wanna tell you guys is that if you do have aphids, it doesn't matter what kind of aphid you have. An aphid is an aphid is an aphid. So if you have black aphids, or if you have red aphids, or if you have green aphids, you treat them all exactly the same. So it doesn't matter what color they are. If they are aphids, you're going to treat aphids the same way. So those are the things I look for. Damage to my blooms, damage to my leaves, and then signs of the actual pest. So I'm going to do a bit of a humble brag right now <laughs> and tell you all I cannot find damage of buttworms on my petunias right now, which is a great thing. I'm super excited about that. I'm glad that it, it has not become an issue. I know it probably will be an issue. We've had very, very strange weather for us, but I know that they're there because I did find one over here. So technically I don't have to spray today, but I'm going to spray anyway because I have found signs of them and it's that time of year and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I couldn't find evidence on my supertunias, but I did find evidence over here in my fairy garden of slugs and snails. Now it could be either earwigs or slugs and snails. Again, it doesn't matter, um, but I do think it's slugs and snails because I, I did see some slime trails. So let's see here, right here in this leaf, you can see there's holes right there. So the holes, I think these are slugs and snails because they're kind of smooth. Again, um, jagged holes will be earwigs, smooth holes will be slugs and snails. Doesn't really matter because you would use sluggo for each of it. I, I have to show you guys, this is so cute. So this is my daughter's fairy garden. They set it all up and then kids come here and they play and they leave little gifts for the fairies. It's so sweet. My daughters didn't put these here. Other kids came and put these here. Look at this. Isn't that cute? Um, so because this is a kid play area, I'm actually not gonna do anything for the slugs and snails here. I'm just gonna let it go. And if the slugs and snails wanna eat these coleus, then fine, like that's totally fine. But I don't wanna put anything in there um, because obviously the kids are playing around. Now Sluggo is kid and pet safe, but if they're digging around in here, I think that it's probably just smarter <laughs> not to do any of that. I luckily also don't have any signs of aphids in my garden right now, but I'll show you all a clip of when I had aphids on my ivy espalier and that was really bad i've also had them on my bougainvillea i've also had them on roses before so it happens right it just happens to be a good time of year for my garden so what do i do with all of these what, what do i do with the pests when i notice signs of pests what's the thing that comes to my mind and the thing that comes to my mind i like to follow the ipm pest management and that that stands for integrated pest management and i feel like that is a a terrible name, a terribly overcomplicated name for something that's very
very simple. Basically what IPM means is it means you start with the least toxic approach and then work your way up. So you always want to want to do the easiest thing, the least amount of um, uh, mess with the garden before you start using things like pesticides and insecticides and herbicides. Um, so there's there's more than one reason to use the IPM approach. The main reason is of course for the environment and it's really important for the environment. But I think that we all as gardeners need to emphasize the fact that you wanna use the least toxic approach because it's actually better for your garden in that if you use something that's too strong, you're gonna mess with the balance of your garden. And I know this from experience and don't come at me <laughs> for telling you guys this because this was beginner gardener Janie, novice gardener Janie, I didn't know any better. But basically when we first moved into this house the first year, I planted sal a whole bunch of salvia and I had white flies everywhere. I had white flies on almost every single plant. And I went to the garden center and I asked them and I said, what do I do about white flies? Cause I didn't know anything. And they said, spray a, st a strong stream of water because they're soft bodied insects and you know, and all that kind of stuff. And I thought my immediate, my immediate thought was, yeah, right. <laughs> like that's not going to do anything. A strong, strong stream of water. Give me a break. So what I did is I went and I got one of those, um, systemic insecticides, systemic pesticides, so bad you guys. So basically you can get some really, really strong pesticides, insecticides, miticides, kind of a combo and it can attack all the issues at once, right? And I actually came out here and I did spray that and my whole garden smelled like chemicals and I thought that I was taking care of the problem. In reality, I was making my problem worse because what I did when I sprayed that really, really strong pesticide, I killed everything in my garden, everything, including the beneficial insects. So that whole year I had pest problems galore. It was just one thing after another because I disrupted the balance, the ecosystem balance that I had here in my garden. So I very quickly learned my lesson that that is not the way to go. And that is kind of what IPM, the whole process of IPM is try and have the least effect on everything else while you deal with the one problem. So for instance, if you have budworms, the IPM approach to budworms would be to actually look for the budworms, pick them off with your hands and smash them just like I did yesterday, right? If you have slugs and snails or earwigs, it would be set traps. There are, you know, there's beer, um, uh, tuna cans of beer that the slugs and snails will be attracted to and then they'll drown in that. There's the wet newspaper rolls. There's a whole bunch of traps that you can set for earwigs and slugs and snails that are not going to affect anything else in your garden. And then aphids, uh, mechanical <laughs> pest control, which is smashing them, or you can use the water, you know, the stream of water as well. By using the least toxic approach as much as possible, you're going to keep the balance in your garden and I promise you, your whole garden is gonna be healthier and you're not going to have to deal with the problem as much as time goes on. It's all going to kind of even itself out. That's why everybody always, um, recommends planting pollinator friendly plants because again those attract the beneficial beneficial insects and then those beneficial insects will eat the bad insects and then your garden will be that much better so i made that one mistake early early on in my gardening um, journey and i i quickly learned that that was not the way to go long-winded <laughs> explanation of ipm but i just think that it's really important to understand that wait for the camera Wait for the camera. Bye, Jason. <laughs> He's off to work. Okay, change of plans, you guys. <laughs> it started completely raining and even a little bit of thunder. So I will not be spraying my BT today. Unfortunately, it's okay because it didn't completely need it. I was kind of just being a little ahead of the game, especially because I saw that one budworm. But that is okay. I'm still going to explain it to you all because I think that it will really help. So let me tell you 
first, what I do for budworms. All right, so budworms are probably the most annoying pest that I have in my garden. I think that that is because I have so many supertunias that there's a lot for them to eat. So it is something that I need to stay on top of. So for my IPM approach, so the least toxic approach for budworms is I will actually pick them off and smash them on the sidewalk. It's totally gross, but it works. It, you know, if I can find them, I will definitely pick them off and I absolutely hate it. And the second thing I was thinking about what else I do uh, for budworms and I've actually trained or educated, I should say, my girls, my children to chase the white butterflies out of my garden. So if you see the white cabbage moth butterflies um, flying around your garden, those are the butterflies that lay the eggs that become budworms. So if you see those, get them out of there because they are eventually going to do damage to your garden. So that's the second thing that I do, the least toxic approach. That unfortunately doesn't take care of everything. I just, I can't be out here searching for budworms all the time. So what I use, what I was saying, I spray BT. BT is Bacillus thuringiensis. It is a naturally occurring bacteria that is found in soil. It's actually even found in some waterways as well. I am not brand specific. I just tend to go for the Monterey brand because that's usually what my garden center has available. And so that's usually the one that I grab. So BT is what's called a biopesticide. It is a pesticide that can kill the pests in your garden, but it, it's natural. And usually biopesticides are least less harmful than regular pesticides. So I wanted to clarify, I was talking about systemic uh, pesticides. And truly what a systemic pesticide is, is it's something that a chemical that the plant will take up actually into its cells and that chemical will stay in that plant cells. So every single bug that can be affected by that chemical, chemical that comes to that plant will be affected um, and will possibly die, most likely die. So that's why systemic pesticides are not good. BT is, a, a, like I said, a biopesticide, and it is very targeted to only certain types of things. You, mainly caterpillars, larvae, um, you can find certain strains of BT that attack nematodes, and you can find certain strains that attack mosquitoes. I actually also use um, BT uh, via Mosquito Bits, that's another, um, a brand that I like using, and I use that as a drench on my seedlings to deal with fungus gnats. And it's the same, it's the same mechanism that works, that is how it kills it. So how it kills it is you spray the foliage and the larvae, the caterpillar will come and it'll ingest the foliage that has the BT on it. They will ingest it and because the caterpillar that you're trying to attack has more alkaline stomach, um, chemical makeup, the BT, the bacteria, the BT works inside their stomach and actually burns holes in their stomach. I'm sorry, it's gross. But then there's holes in the larvae stomach or the cat the budworm stomach. And um, whenever they eat anything else, they basically starve to death and it like seeps out into their body and they die. It does take about one to five days for the budworm to die once they've ingested the BT. So a lot of people will still see them crawling around and think, well, this stuff doesn't work. I have to use more stuff, but just give it time and it will work. You have to give it time. Now to use it safely, um, it doesn't really affect bees. They've done a lot of studies on it. Um, first of all, it doesn't affect waterways because it's found naturally in waterways. Of course, you don't want to like, you know, use a watering can and, and drench the, your whole area so you have runoff, right? I'm talking about regular use. You always want to read um, the back of the carton for whatever brand you're using because everyone's different depending on uh, mixing it up and the amounts and all that kind of stuff. So it doesn't affect waterways and it actually doesn't affect bees. And even if you accidentally get it on the bees, it's not gonna affect their activity. There's been studies on that. I'll try and link them down below. However, you kind of don't wanna spray them at the time the bees are out because BT does break down in response to UV rays, so sunlight. So if you spray BT in the sun, the sun will actually break the BT down within about an hour and render it ineffective. So the best time to spray BT is at night 
not so much because of the bees will kind of because you don't want to bug them right but it's not really going to harm them but mainly it's to be most effective you also don't want to spray it when it's raining right because that's going to rinse it off um, and so that's not a good time to spray them so either way in the morning or way at night is when you want to spray bt you want to spray bt all over the foliage all over the buds and try and get all areas of it wherever that budworm or caterpillar are going to eat now if you have a pollinator garden, you have to be careful because Bt will kill all butterfly larvae. So it will kill monarch larvae and it will kill swallowtail larvae. So you just have to be careful if you have something like milkweed or another host plant that those type of butterflies are going to be on. You want to keep the Bt far away from it and also make sure you're not spraying it on a windy day so that there's going to get some drift. So in the peak of the summer, I'm usually spraying Bt about once a week, once every other week. Um, sometimes I will spray it preemptively just to be extra careful like say I have a garden tour coming up right I did spray it right before the garden tour just to make sure there was nothing no no budworms were going to affect it or anything like that I mean I'm sure it broke down after <laughs> Like a, only a little bit um, because I was spraying it and it was sunny and all that kind of stuff. Um, but other than that, I don't really do it systemically unless I actually see signs of budworms. But more times than not, I do see signs of budworms just like last night. I did see a budworm on my homestead verbena. So anyway, that is what I do for budworms. Now for earwigs, slugs, and snails, what I use is this stuff. Sluggo Plus, and you can actually get this at Costco, which is really great. So for my IPM approach for slugs and snails and earwigs, the main thing that I do is wait, patience. And that actually is an IPM technique, waiting until the pest isn't going to bother your garden anymore. So those of you that have been watching me for a while this season know that we've had a very wet winter and therefore a very wet moist winter means more slugs and snails. And they've lasted a lot longer than they normally do here in my garden. So I've tried to be very, very patient and tried to wait for it to heat up because once it heats up the slugs and snails aren't going to bother me anymore the other thing i do that's non-toxic for slugs and snails is keep my garden clean if you have big piles of leaves everywhere or uh, plants that you haven't kind of cleaned up those are the perfect spots for slugs snails and earwigs to hide under to live under and they will just reproduce and they'll get more and more you know you'll have more and more of them so Another really good thing that you can do for your garden is keep your garden clean. Keep the leaves picked up, the piles of leaves picked up. Keep the old leaves like um, my Helen von Stein is a big one. If I keep those leaves nice and clean, then there's not as much places for the slugs and snails and earwigs to hide under. Of course, I'm not going to be able to get all of it. So what I do is I use um, Sluggo Plus. And Sluggo Plus is another biopesticide and it is a dual biopesticide. It has spinosad and then it also has um, iron phosphate. I always forget that word. Uh, so both of those are naturally, naturally found in the soil as well, but they've just taken them and they've put them in a pelletized form with the goal of the slugs, snails, and earwigs to eat them, ingest them. It actually makes their stomach hurt. They get nauseous and they don't want to eat. And then they basically don't eat and they shrivel up and die. It, it is pet safe. It is kid safe. Um, unless the pets and kids like swallow a handful of it or something like that and if your pet and kid does that you have bigger problems um but i did want to <laughs> i did want to say a difference between sluggo plus and then snail bait which is metaldehyde i think that i'm pronouncing that right uh metaldehyde yeah metaldehyde that stuff is poison that stuff can kill your dog or kill a dog that's walking by i know in the uk it is outlawed i'm not sure if it's outlawed in um in the united states what i do is that i'll just go around sluggo plus works best on moist soil but not wet soil so you basically just want to sprinkle it around whatever plant is bothering it 
um, you know, like hostas are, are kind of the big one for me. Um, and you just kind of sprinkle it around and then you just, you know, you put it in a ring and then it'll protect it. A lot of people complain about the mold because the pellets will actually get mold on them. And what that is, is that's just another naturally occurring fungus in the soil that attaches to the pellets. It still works absolutely fine. Slugs and snails are still going to be affected even if it's moldy. It just doesn't look as nice. And what they recommend is just not to use too much, not to use too much of the Slego Plus. So eventually it will dissolve and then it won't bother you anymore. So that's what I use for slugs, snails, and earwigs. Um, I did want to say in my question and answer video, I was talking about this exact same thing. And one of you emailed me, I'm sorry, I don't remember your name right now, but you are, or they were organic farmers actually close, close by me. And they use um, you guys know that those peppers that you put on pizza, the pepper flakes, the dried pepper flakes, they use that mixed with diatomaceous earth and sprinkle that around. And they say that that works wonderfully for slugs and snails. So if you have slugs and snails in your vegetable garden, you can use that mixture if you want to keep it organic, or you can use it, even use coffee grounds. I've never tried either one of those, but if you guys are looking for an organic approach, um, the, uh, anecdotally, I have heard that that works really well well. All right. And then finally, the last one is aphids. And I've talked about this a lot, but basically aphids, I have found the best thing to do is the mechanical <laughs> pest control, which is putting on some gloves and squishing them. I really think that that's the best way to go. If your garden is too big and you can't do that, you can take a jet sprayer hose and jet sprayer and spray the plant and they are all soft bodied and so it's going to not only smash the aphid but that spray that stream of water is actually going to knock the aphid off of the plant and any sucking insect so an aphid sucks out the juices of the plant any sucking infet an insect they have mouth parts they don't even there's not even a really good name from they're called mouth parts and when you spray and knock the aphid off you actually I'm sorry you rip out their mouth parts so they're gonna fall off and it's not like they climb back up and keep chewing again once they fall off you've ripped off their mouth part so they die because they can't eat anymore so that's why a, spr a strong stream of water works really well too um, so yeah so those two things are the big things if it's a massive problem massive problem you can't can use insecticidal soap. And insecticidal soap is basically glorified dish soap mixed together. It basically coats the area wherever the aphids are and it suffocates them. Um, I also think, this is just me, I think that it makes them kind of slip off so that they can't keep climbing on it, right? But that's just me. That's just what I think of in my mind when, I, when I'm spraying the insecticidal soap. I really don't spray the insecticidal soap much because I really think that smashing the aphids works wonders. And again, if your garden is in balance, if you, if you haven't killed the beneficials, if it's balanced, if it's homeostasis or whatever you want to say, then the, the aphids are going to attract the beneficials. And then the beneficials are going to come and they're going to deal with the aphids. So you kind of just have to get your garden into a nice balance. The last thing I want to say about aphids is ants protect aphids. I know that that's very strange to say, but it's absolutely true. Um, ants actually farm aphids. So ants will eat aphids, excrete honeydew. They, their, their excrement, their poop. I'm sorry. I'm talking so much about poop this, <laughs> this video. Uh, aphids will actually poop out honeydew, which is the sweet, sticky stuff. And that's one of the reasons why you know you have aphids because you'll see sweet, sticky stuff all over your plants. But a, uh, ants actually eat that. So ants will actually protect aphids from the beneficial insects that are trying to eat the aphids. The ants will protect them and keep them. So if you see aphids if you, if you attack the, the ants that are around the aphids, that's going to help. So if you have aphids up in a tree and then you notice on your tree trunk that you have ants 
climbing up and down, you know those ants are farming those aphids up in the tree and they're protecting whatever pest is coming to eat those aphids. So what you wanna to do to deal with the aphids up in your tree, the first step is to deal with the ants that are climbing up and down the trunk. So one of the things that you can do is you can put a product called Tanglefoot around the base of the tree, which is just the sticky strip. And of course the ants get stuck on it. Then the ants cannot climb the tree and protect the aphids and then those beneficials will come in and will eat the aphids. Um, so that's another thing to kind of think about. Now, ants in the ground is another story because ants in the ground are really, really hard to deal with. Again, ants in the ground um, will farm aphids, of course, right? However, they're much harder to deal with. They've actually found, at least in California, that they've tested ants all the way at the very top of the state in Northern California, and then all the way down in San Diego, and they found that they are part of the same colony. So that means there are colonies of ants that span the whole distance of California, and I, of course, only know about California. There are, ant, there are ant colonies that span the whole distance. So for you to come out here, and I've done this before, to come out here and set those ant traps out here um, in your garden, it's honestly, it's not gonna do too much. It's not gonna help you too much. You can try and do it, um, but really something like dealing with ants in a tree is going to be much more effective than dealing with ants in the ground. And I have so many ants in this garden. My town, Davis, we have a lot of ants here. So it is definitely a problem, but it's a problem that there's not too much we can do about. So you kind of just have to work around it. All right, everyone, so I apologize. This video has turned into a talking head video where I just talk to you all the whole time. I had fully planned to do some pest control out here today, but it's just not the right day for it. It's not the right conditions. Uh, but again, I really wanted to share this information with you. So having said all of that, looking, looking for the pests, identifying the pests, uh, treating the pests appropriately with the IPM technique, you know, least toxic first. The most important thing I can say to you all is prevention is key. Doing a couple things in your garden that's going to prevent a problem getting started in the first place, I think is going to make the most difference in your garden. So there are four ways that I think are important for preventing pests in your garden. Um, one of them is most important, don't use the strong chemicals. Don't use the systemic stuff, broad spectrum stuff, because that is, again, that's going to disrupt the balance that you have in your garden. And it's actually going to make everything worse. So do yourself a favor and just don't do that. Don't go for that. That's not the thing that you want to do. Trust me. I've, I've done it. <laughs> the, the second thing you want to do is you want to plant plants that are going to attract pollinators. That is going to make absolutely the biggest difference in the world. If you have, say for example, a rose garden. Rose gardens are beautiful. There are a lot of like formal rose gardens that's just roses and then maybe boxwood surrounding that. That's gorgeous, that's absolutely beautiful. You still have to plant other plants around those roses to attract the pollinators that are going to eat the aphids that are on those roses. I mean, just, just add in a couple plants that are going to attract the pollinators, add in a couple salvia or something like that. It really is going to make a huge difference for your pest control. So whatever it is, you want to add in plants that are gonna attract pollinators. Um, on that note, you can actually add beneficial pollinators into your garden, which is prevention. And what I do is I actually, every season I go to the store and I purchase ladybugs. Now this is, controversial one because they say you know you take ladybugs they they harvest them from their natural habitat but i feel like you know i'm giving them bugs to eat anyway so it's fine um and then uh, actually master gardener says we had one uh presenter who said that it's a waste of time because 90 percent of them fly away and i agree 90 percent of them fly away when you release ladybugs in your garden however a lot of them do stay and i know that because i see ladybugs all over in my garden ever since i started releasing ladybugs in my garden you do want to release them at night so that they stay in your garden and they don't immediately fly away to your neighbor's garden um, and then you have to think about not spraying things that are going to kill the ladybugs as soon as you put them in there so i've noticed massive differences once i started releasing ladybugs in my garden you can also get beneficial nematodes you can also purchase uh, 
lease wings. So all of those things are going to be increasing the diversity of the uh, beneficials in your garden, which is really important. The fourth thing for prevention I wanted to reiterate to you all is keeping your garden clean, keeping the leaf piles picked up. If you have a compost pile, keep it in one area, um, cleaning off the dead leaves on the bottom of the plants. The cleaner you have your garden, the less bugs are going to have um, room to live. Of course, that means the less, the less spot beneficials are going to have room to live as well but if slugs and snails and earwigs are a big problem for you keep preventing them from establishing themselves in your garden by keeping your garden clean is really going to help so anyway <laughs> i will get off my soapbox now i hope this helped you all please let us know in the comment section down below what you do for your pests, whatever pests are most common in your garden, particularly those of you dealing with Japanese beetles. If you have any other tips and tricks for the rest of you that deal with Japanese beetles, I just, the only thing I know is picking them off and putting them in a, in a bucket of soapy water. So whatever pest you're dealing with and you figured out how to deal it, you figure out the magic touch, please leave it in the comment section down below. I appreciate you all watching. I hope you enjoyed this and I hope you all have a chance to get in your garden today.